breathtaking pace. China is home to 1.35 billion, while India is nipping at the heels at 1.3 billion, comprising nearly half of the global total. The two biggest nations are also the two largest consumers of the precious metals, and the trend is expected to accelerate as expansion of the middle class lifestyle proliferates and currency issues continue to plague both hemispheres. Joining me with their thoughts on the big prospects for precious metal shares and bullion, Bill Murphy from Gata.org returns with a tribute to Eric Sprott, a precious metals expert, philanthropist, and self-made billionaire. The friend of the show thinks gold shares could present a rare valuation opportunity following an ETF rebalancing. Then Bob Hoy of Institutional Advisors shares his technical insights. He's watching the precious metals miners closely, anticipating sharp moves ahead and we also discuss the stock market rally and remember to sign up for the alpha stocks newsletter if you haven't already we have a must read report this week with two diversified etfs providing approximately a 20 percent annual yield with minimal risk due to wide diversification so if you'd like to boost your portfolio's overall yield this might be just what you need and Robert Ian wraps up the show with his latest report. We'd like to hear your questions and comments. You can just call into the hotline if you like, 1-641-715-3900, and you'll need our mailbox number, 514049. That number again, 641-715-3900, mailbox 514049. Goldseek.com radio begins now with a market weather recap. Visibility virtually unlimited over the precious metals sector as investors turned again to gold and silver amid unexpectedly strong CPI numbers. Gold added just $1, finishing around $12.27 an ounce, but silver picked up $0.13, cents, ending the week around $16.40. The precious metals XAU shares rebounded sharply, adding 5, 6% at 85. Black gold tacked on $1.60, nearing $48 per barrel. The top stories moving the precious metals markets included weak U.S. retail sales and solid inflation in the U.S. economy, which hinted that U.S. economic growth estimates might be overly optimistic. The core consumer price index climbed, albeit at less than expected, around one-tenth of one percent in April. In related news, lower than expected retail sales hinted that the retail apocalypse continues, in turn improving the case for Federal Reserve tightening at the next FOMC meeting slated for June, where the current Fed funds futures indicate we'll see a quarter point rate hike. Plus on Thursday, news that the U.S. jobless benefits hit a 28-year low suggested that policymakers would have greater room to raise rates if necessary. One Bank of Boston president, Eric Rosengren, urged his colleagues to raise the rates three more times this year and start to shrink the Fed's balance sheet. But his colleague, Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, says he expects two more rate hikes this year. And I concur with him. That's what the Fed funds futures are indicating. Three is a bit aggressive and it's it sounds like more Fed speak rhetoric. Plus, the St. Louis Fed's website shows nearly record balance sheet numbers right now. No hint whatsoever of a decline. In fact, it looks like we could see a breakout to new highs. Precious metals, bottom line. Well, it clearly was an unusual week. The precious metals moved higher in lockstep with the U.S. dollar. We've seen a lot of that action lately. While the shares moved even higher, and that's, of course, a positive bull market sign. Nevertheless, the technical damage over the past couple of months has been intense. So I'd like to see the precious metals commodities sector and the crude oil market move solidly back above support, build up momentum for a new push to bull market highs. Partly cloudy skies appeared over the New York Stock Exchange. Weak retail numbers hinted at somewhat less than robust economic conditions. Investors in the blue chips and bellwether sectors at least decided to lock in some profits, but the tech sector rolled forward. By Friday's closing bell on the Dow Jones Industrials, the index was off 110 points, not much, finishing at 2896. The S&P 500 lost 8 points, finishing at 2391. While the Nasdaq, though, added 20 points, bucking the trend, finishing at 6121. Lastly, the Bitcoin ETF, though, 
really stole the show, adding 100 points at one point, reaching an all-new high of 260 before settling in at 185. That looks very much like the peak for some time in the Bitcoin market. Moving on, the retail apocalypse continued to plague the shares, with Nordstrom the latest retailer to disappoint Wall Street on earnings estimates. Nevertheless, tech stocks plowed higher, pushing the Nasdaq to yet another all-time record high. Our Alpha Stocks newsletter has at least five key tech stocks that have outperformed the markets for subscribers, and we expect them to continue to do so. European stocks also struggled, recording the sharpest decline in three weeks on this Thursday. Bottom line on equities. The U.S. stock market remains one of the most vibrant bullish trends in decades. Our fear to greed sentiment index. Current conditions are perfectly poised for further gains. Coming up after the break, more Gold Seek Radio. Our next featured guest, Bob Hoy from Institutional Advisors. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome back our featured guest today, Bob Hoy, Chief Investment Strategist of InstitutionalAdvisors.com. Welcome back, Bob Hoy. Yeah, good to be with you. Action in the precious metals market. Gold or silver going up uh, days on days. You get a lot of comment by the pundits about this. And then, of course, this one, when you had something like 17 or 18 down days in a row for silver, Googled around it. Nobody was saying anything about it. So You're taking the uh, the interesting contrarian perspective here and, and noting that the herd is so oftentimes wrong, or at least on the wrong side of the trade. They're quiet about the trade and what it was. We uh, follow the gold-silver ratio very closely, and it tells a story when it's moving. Uh, first of all, when the ratio becomes volatile, it suggests a financial change is possible, meaning a change in the financial market. So when it goes up, it then suggests that if there's a party on in the financial market, that it will come to an end and, and or at least suffer a, a, a correction. So this is what you had with the gold-silver ratio got down to, uh, I think, 67 a little while ago, and needed to break above certain levels. Let me get over to... came down to uh, 68. That was the low in April. That was a test of the 67.6 low at the 1st of March. Now, when the ratio comes down, you're in uh, party time for wherever the party's going to happen, stocks, bonds, commodities, that sort of thing. And uh, we had the move in commodities Essentially, the um, industrial commodities like crude oil and base metals rallying probably till around March. So this is where things began to change. And then the gold-silver ratio, as I said, the last test on it was down to 68 in early April. So the first move was getting up to 70, and that then got through the two key near-term moving averages, the 50-day and the 200-day. So getting above that was constructive number one. And then it had to get above the last high uh, in March at 72, which it did in late May. And then it's gone on right on up to uh, last week, uh, right on up to uh, 76.6, which is... uh, very breathtaking move for the gold-silver ratio, and it's right up there and uh, became a little overdone on the on the momentum thing on the RSI. So we were aware that the gold-silver ratio could go up. It had become volatile. And then the next thing was to look for the breakout, which was at uh, the first breakout, which was at 70 on those moving averages, and then the next was actually on the index at 72. So it's up to 77, became a little overdone. But the key thing on it, Chris, is that this is saying that there's financial troubles ahead. And what we call it is the the metallic credit spread, the gold divided by silver. And then what you also have here is that in the credit markets themselves, you have the uh, credit spreads, which is the difference between high-grade and low-grade bonds, they got trashed going into January, February 2016 with the crash in crude oil down to 
$126. So then, since then, it was a full year of recovery, and it turned out to be a fabulous move in uh, the ba- in the base metals and in uh, in crude oil, and also in the credit spreads. Just an outstanding move where uh, spreads were narrowing, and that sort of uh, reaching excesses in here. But within it, you also had the gold silver ratio coming down, 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 down into March, and then now up. So it's a distinctive break, and we would look for credit spreads to follow the actual spreads between high-grade and low-grade bonds. And we're also looking for the yield curve to make a turn in here, which is, the, of course, the difference between in treasuries between long end and short or maturities. And it, it is, let's call it this way, for the last month it's been attempting to change trend and hasn't quite made it. And on the credit spreads, you can often, when you've got party time in the spread market, where we have been, it can party into, into June on a seasonal basis and then start the turn. So we see that perhaps at this juncture, the gold-silver ratio is leading. Uh, the uh, credit spreads are, well, let's put it this way, they're no longer narrowing. So there's a pause going on there. And then also on on the Treasury curve, uh, there's a pause going on there, probably building for a change. So what that has been doing for us is setting us up for a change in the party mode in the, in the, in the credit markets, and that would then have repercussions into the base metals, into crude oil, and into the stock market. It's always fascinating to watch the, the uh, credit market. You've talked extensively about the gold to silver ratio, and it's something I try to keep on my radar screen as well. Uh, in fact, I appreciate your analysis in the area. I've struggled, though, to find any um, interesting correlations. I mean, just, just a little side note here. Uh, studying you know, for the actuarial exams, they just really want the student to have fully incorporated this concept of correlation. So correlation is just simply your covariance of your two companies divided by the square root of the variance of company A and company B. That's it. That's your correlation. But it really provides fascinating information into the expectations for your portfolio. So in the past, you haven't been too sanguine on the prospects for the precious metals on a forward basis. But you do seem to think that we're past the worst of this reaction. Is that fair to say? Yeah. The way we're looking at it, we couldn't see much rally for gold, but we're... uh focusing on that the gold-silver ratio would change. So as it turned out, there wasn't a huge change in gold, and most of the action was in silver going down, which has become short-term oversold a few days ago. So this is why you can get a rally in silver, you can get a rally in base metals. But further out, you also have the U.S. dollar index in a pattern where it is setting up for a pretty good advance, and that, again, is not going to be too friendly to the gold and silver. I'm so glad you brought this up because, um, as I mentioned, you know, I tinker around a lot with my uh, Alpha Stocks newsletter to give, you know, just a solid portfolio each week, call it our portfolio laboratory. We compare some ignored, but I think essential components uh, to a portfolio, such as the cryptocurrency craze. We use GBTC, which represents, of course, the Bitcoin. And we're finding some interesting relationships and correlations uh, between the U.S. dollar and between U.S. shares and the precious metals there. I bet you've noticed the recent disconnect in correlation between gold and the U.S. dollar. Usually we have that solid inverse relationship, but it seems like week after week we see dollar weakness but no gold strength. We've noticed it and have been not calling for much in the way of gold rallies because one of the features of a post-bubble contraction is a firmer senior currency, which still happens to be the U.S. dollar. And so you have that that possibility. And also, you've had the gold bugs suffer a couple of, well, you had the bear market from 2011 right down till the end of 2015. And we were on to that potential change at a good rally. And I pointed out something in last week's edition whereby 
that if you had a 10% rally in gold off of a low, the gold bugs would come out with forecasts that it's going to 5,000. Whereas if you had a rally like in 2016 where it was a 20% rally in gold off of a low, that then prompted all kinds of forecasts that gold was going to go to 10,000. On gold's price in dollars, the inhibition is that the dollar index is likely to firm up here over the next little while. And with us, it was the action was in the ratio, and that with gold staying oh relatively steady, that's where most of the price change came into into silver and it trashed it. We'll get a short term rally out of it here recently, but into June, late June, most of the industrial commodities weakening. You could have the U.S. dollar firming. And in which case, the gold and silver uh, wouldn't be doing so well. But if you get the situation where we're going into a financial uh, distress, then silver would really fall relative to gold. Uh, you can take a look at it over the last 300 years where uh, you can get a uh, gold-silver ratio in uh Dollars and then before that in sterling uh, when it was the senior currency. And uh, if you look at the, the major booms and contractions in financial history, of which there have been some uh, huge ones, the tendency is that the gold silver ratio goes down in the good times and it goes up in the bad times. And I think the last high was around 100 on the gold silver ratio. And then you've got metals analysts out there looking at, and they dream up that the amount of silver being mined and the amount of gold being mined is at a 16 to 1. Therefore, it should trade at 16 to 1. And historically, in the, in the 1700s, it traded at, six, you know, between 15 and 16. Actually, it was a, in, uh, in London, in Sterling, it was a very tight trading range there. And it wasn't until the 1825, 1830s, where there was enough of a price movement that you could really appreciate it. It jumps out at you. The gold-silver ratio goes down when there's a party on, and it goes up when the party's over. Of course, this is not exactly preaching to the choir here today, but that's okay because we need both sides of the argument to have sort of a balanced dialogue, if you will. We can't put blinders on. Sticking the head in the sand is not going to help our portfolios one bit. And I think Bob Hoy, if I understand you correctly, is not overweighting the portfolio today. I've got some expiration favorites that I like and I'm working on actually doing financing on one now, but... You can have a bull based upon a dollar that is not changing, because going back into the 1800s, you had uh, uh, gold was fixed in U.S. dollar terms and also in sterling terms. But you would have uh, the real price of gold would go up and down, and when, when it was going up in real terms, uh, that was very exciting for uh, for the exploration and for the mining community. And uh, so we're looking for this. At some point, the uh, real price of gold will have got up enough that people, mining analysts, start seeing the profitability rolling into the sector. And they can forget about uh, what the price of gold is going to do in U.S. dollars. It, it really hasn't made too much money for anybody for the last few years. But we think the place to be uh, is for an investor to be looking at the earnings on the gold mining side and at some point recognizing that, hey, there's a pretty good uptrend in earnings. When you go back to the uh, to the 19, late 1920s and that boom, when Homestake was the senior producer and the stock got crashed down to something like eight and a half in the crash. But in 1930, 31, you could have bought the stock at $9 a share. And then at the end of 1932, and this was before Roosevelt started fooling around with the price of gold, so the gold was still at $20.67 an ounce, but their earnings had gone up by about 130%, mainly because the, the real price of gold had gone up by 130%. So the stock, as I say, in 31 and 32 did very well. 
And then Roosevelt got on the bandwagon with the rising real price and then added even more to it so that eventually Homestake stock in the mid-1930s, 36, 37, 38, was trading, oh, let me think about, I think around $60 on a $9 purchase. And in those days, the mining company used to pay out most everything and by way of dividend. And it was paying four fifty a share dividend, and and you had a very original nine dollar purchase. What I'm trying to do is is point out to investors trying to make money out of gold when you're in U.S. dollars can be frustrating, but making money out of gold shares in when you're in U.S. dollars can be very profitable if you play it right. Now that is music to our gold aficionados ears today. And let me just corroborate your thoughts. Peter Spina, the young wizard who started Gold Seek, it has to be almost 20 years ago, he has passed along a remarkable uh, miner to me, a producer, and I have I'm actually have it up on my Alpha Stocks newsletter list. And I've pushed a lot of the Texas No Limits chips, but there are some other question marks here. And I know you're watching U.S. Equities. I just talked to Martin Armstrong. We had him on the show. I know you're familiar with the forecaster, big movie, very controversial figure, great guy. One of the few people on our show to say the U.S. Stock stock market has not even likely begun its ascent. He believes, as do frankly do I, that we are in the middle of a melt up uh, similar to circa 2000, maybe more like 1928-29. It's difficult to forecast just how high this market could ascend before the madness of the crowd dissipates. What are your thoughts? We've been playing it quarter by quarter uh, from uh, October we're figuring whatever problems were in the market would likely clear. That's the usual seasonal. Then my technical colleague on November the 3rd got a, what we call a springboard buy, which is a signal within a flat to rising market trend. And then along came Trump win with what we've been calling the pro-business administration. We called the, the, the initial move right up till February as rational exuberance because it was based upon a potential change to a pro-business administration, also getting rid of the most anti-business administration in U.S. history, which is all very constructive. And then by February, you had some of the uh, technical indicators getting really overblocked, so we've just been calling it plain exuberance. And exuberant it is, except for the last few weeks, which has been uh, let's call it moderate levitation. This can continue. Uh, we haven't seen the changes in credit spreads that one can get when one has been in a market as exciting as we've been in. And we're not getting the change in the yield curve yet, but they will change at some point and give us the advance on probably the... Uh, the end of this bull market. And now, um, throughout history, the great bull markets going back to the South Sea bubble in 1720, and then the next one was 1772, and, and etc. 1825, 1873, 1929, then 2007, that as they occurred in Europe, those bubbles uh, reached excesses in May or June of the year. Remember the old saying, sell in May and go away. But then with New York became uh, an important market, not the senior market, but by 18, the 1873 bubble, New York was an important market. Europe and England reached their highs in May, June, and then New York made a speculative high in September of that critical year. And then the same thing happened in 1929 when uh, Europe set highs in May and June, and the New York Stock Exchange came in with that extra leg of speculation in September. So who knows, this could happen. Uh, how high is high? We don't know yet. We know that the limitations will be begin to be seen when the credit markets turn. Uh, they're still positive. So uh, it looks like the North American markets, Toronto and New York, could have a uh, a pleasant time during the summer. It, there, as I said, there's a probability that, say, the European market, but we looked at the technicals the other day on the stocks, European stocks, and also on the CAC 40 or whatever it is. No, we were not getting technical excesses there. So 
as far as the uh, rising market can go, it's going to rise until we see something adverse. I like that. You know, let's keep it simple. And I try to keep it simple here, too. You know, I keep an eye. A seven momentum and sentiment indicator created by USA Today. Anybody can pop it up on your Google search. Just type in there. It incorporates everything from the put-call ratio, the traditional, to a few more, I think, intriguing uh, concepts. But I think mirrors most of what you've pointed out here today, that despite the fact we might regularly be seeing new highs, there's no euphoria. We're not getting the that crescendo that tends to accompany peaks and zeniths in U.S. shares, the U.S. equities markets. The seasonal is that things are going to be good through till June. First step. Then we see what happens after that. But at the moment, we're still riding the positive into a seasonal high around June. All right, Bob Hoy, Institutional Advisors, a lot of fun and really useful, pertinent information. We're going to look forward to having you back on GoldSeek again in 2017. Very good, then. Chris, always fun to be with you. The gold and silver mining sector is red hot. Every investment portfolio needs precious metal shares. Goldseek.com's top stock analysts have done it again, identifying the next solid gold nugget opportunity, Brazil Resources. Based in the eighth largest economy with a mining-friendly reputation, almost 10 million ounces of gold reserves. Industry insiders are accumulating shares of Brazil Resources. The notable management team includes Chairman Amir Adnani, a rising star in the mining industry with a reputation for moving projects rapidly into production. Fortune Magazine lists Chairman Adnani in the prestigious list of 40 under 40 ones to watch. Plus, shareholders benefit from the insights and backing of enigmatic Brazilian billionaire Mario Garnero, CEO of Brazil Invest Group, the nation's foremost merchant and investment bank and founding director. Their Sao George project is 100% owned with paved highway access, a nearby workforce, and a hydroelectric power source near the major gold deposits. Their next top project includes three deposits identified by major gold producers, plus their RIA project, which is a joint venture with Arriva, benefits from a $10 million treasure map in the hottest address for uranium production in Canada. But the story gets even more exciting with their Whistler project, offering geographic diversification in South Central Alaska. To find out more about this unique opportunity, please direct your web browsers to brazilresources.com at Yahoo Finance, ticker symbol B-R-I dot V. Remember to ride the exciting gold stock run of 2016 and beyond. Your portfolio will thank you for adding shares of Brazil Resources. Gold Seek employees may or may not own shares. Nothing contained herein should be construed as investment advice. You're back with us at GoldSeek.com Radio. Today's featured guest, Bill Murphy from Gata.org. Bill Murphy runs the Gold Antitrust Action Committee with Chris Powell. They're exposing all of the market manipulation now for well over a decade, just back from an interesting conference in Toronto, I think he said. It was a big tribute from Sprott Inc. for Eric Sprott, who's retiring, and but only from Sprott. He's aggressively buying up all kinds of companies and doing different deals, and he's probably as busy as he's ever been. He just won't be involved in any more of the corporate work, and it was a blast seeing Eric, and he's our hero, and what a great man. Yeah, he's done a lot of great work in the area. And, you know, it's interesting, media coverage on one of his recent statements and that the precious metals miners were gearing up for an explosive move. There was forced, I think he said, ETF reshuffling, and that would create maybe one of the last best buying opportunities for their shares. Well, it's a little over my head. I guess I know it was a big mess, all kinds of things that were going on. I know I did speak with Rick Rule focusing on a lot of the companies that have been abandoned in the sense that if you're not in the ETF, you're not getting bought. So there's a number of companies that are just dying on the vine, and he thinks there's incredible values out there in some of those companies, and he's looking to make a big effort in that area. 
We've had Rick Rule here also on the show, uh, one of the top folks at Sprott, and he just has been a huge proponent of the precious metals miners. And that's interesting you'd mention that because there are so many hundreds, if not maybe even a thousand or more potential prospects for your portfolio, but they don't get the coverage. And it can be difficult for folks to find those rare gems, those nuggets. It's odd because, you know, the U.S. dollar had been under considerable pressure while the metals have been as well. To what do you attribute that disconnect? It's a good point. I know uh, there's a lot of people that follow the, what's going on between gold and the yen, and there has been a remarkable correlation by what's going on there. And, of course, I wonder from a goddess perspective what it means and how they're using the end and what traders do to help them what to accomplish what they want to get done. But that's a very complicated story. But in the end, that's particularly a, a, a god of viewpoint. In other words, the only thing that really matters is what the gold cartel wants to do, what they can get away with, and how they operate. And so all the things that are important all of a sudden aren't important. It was just like when the gold price fell from 1900 to below 1100. I mean, uh, interest rates collapsed. What, is it, what did interest rates going down mean for gold? Nothing. So why should them going up mean anything? What will make a big difference is when this gold cartel, as God calls it, hits the wall in terms of physical and gold supply, physical silver supply, and it's going to lead probably to an explosion out of nowhere. I don't believe you're going to get gradual bull markets anymore. When it goes, it's just going to be bonkers. You know, it's an interesting point because I was just reading over at the Goddess site news releases. One of the more interesting articles on the list, India, just decimated as far as capacity for this 1.3 billion people. They lost their capacity to purchase the yellow metal and silver for several months because of these currency rule changes. Demand leaped something like threefold for the precious metals over last year, close to half the world's populace with a voracious appetite for the yellow metal. Clearly, Asia will be a, a big component. Any any comment on that before we move on? Well, I think you're right, and it's a no-brainer. I mean, India's and China's population is going the way they are, and their economy is growing, and there's a lot of big talk lately about India's economy really taking off relative to others. And now, quite frankly, we need it right now. The gold-silver demand in the United States in our world, of course, is not as, as important as those are really, but it's just it's probably the worst I've ever seen uh, because of what the bitcoins are doing and the cryptocurrencies and real estate and stocks. Gold and silver investors are quitting left and right like I've never seen before. There's very little interest, relatively speaking. And, of course, if you're a contrarian, or you believe that something big is coming, I mean, this is the time to be specially focused, but that's not the way the average investor operates. And, again, it's been too many years of gold and silver sinking up the place versus these other markets. And I think, don't get me wrong, I'm not negative in any way. It's just the way it is, in my opinion. We're going to lead to an explosion out of nowhere that I like to say, heck, some of these cryptocurrencies going up 10, 15, 20 times. Well, so what if silver goes up to six, six times? That just takes us to 100. 100 would be a big deal for us. So that's what I think is coming. So not down at all. I just think it's laying the seeds for something spectacular. And I received a message this weekend from Europe. I don't want to mention the big investor looking for a tenfold increase in silver out of the blue. This is stunning to me because the individual does not wear the perpetual bullish hat. I think he did also reference the cryptocurrency phenomenon, and, and I'm right in the middle of it, okay? I mean, I've been uh, sort of, you might say, at the ground level with the cryptocurrency movement. You know, I was involved with several ICOs, initial currency offerings. For instance, Komodo uh, skyrocketed at least 10 or 20, if not 30. 30 fold, an offshoot of Bitcoin and Ethereum is another one of my favorites that my folks, they garnered 10 fold profits in just a few months. I can see some flaws in the Bitcoin blockchain, but I think when those flaws become more exposed and people begin to take advantage of them, what's going to happen is there's going to be some scares, some Mt. Gox like scares, where you might recall the largest Bitcoin exchange blew up hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoins. They just evaporated. You're going to have an absolute flood of money from cryptocurrencies where everyone thought they were safe going to come looking for the only last safe harbor. And I wanted to move on as we wrap up here today, uh, Bill Murphy, over to the um, Fed Funds Futures contract for higher odds of a rate hike uh, next month. It's virtually a lot. We thought it was going to be July or later. Don't you think the precious metals markets have already factored in this upcoming series of rate hikes? Think of what they came to in 11. What were falling interest rates did it mean for gold and silver? Did interest rates going up now also be it means anything? And yes, you're right, it's factored in. And so I, I think the most important issue is 
things going on in the gold silver world behind the scenes in the derivatives market that we're getting closer and closer to an end game, the last hurrah of the JP Morgan short silver crowd and things are gonna blow up and you never know when it's gonna happen. But if you're a contrarian or you would like terrible sentiment to get involved in something, now's the time to be focused on gold and silver. You know, I think you made a key point here as we wrap up. Maybe it's not so much that climbing rates are negative for precious metals, they just improve the prospects of let's say dividend bearing shares and equities and perhaps certain interest rate streams. The money flows, the capital chases after that higher risk play and ignores the precious metals, which really is great for us in some ways because it creates a buying opportunity, a bargain. Final parting thoughts for listeners as we wrap up. I think what's going to happen is going to come out of nowhere when people least expect it in our world. And as I mentioned, people are so discouraged because of the dichotomy of all of this. And it's going to lead to something very special. And I just hope it happens sooner rather than later. Again, I'll let another thing to second. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm looking for now myself. So we, we see it and not just talk about it. Please tell people more about La Metropole Cafe as well as Gata.org. Well, people can sign up for a two-week free trial. It's what I do. I've been doing it since 1998 and most enjoyable and, and see if it's a, a value. And then www.gata.org, my colleague Chris Powell has done for, seems like it forever too. And he does a great job and they can sign up and get his stuff and what he thinks is important he puts out there. So, uh, we've been a lot of, we have a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun in Toronto, as I mentioned, and, uh, we have many years to come and, Hopefully we've got to win the day first. Well, we're looking forward to that 20-year Gata anniversary bash that's going to take place at Bill Murphy's Palatial Estate in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chris, best to you. Bye-bye. Gold and silver mining sector is red hot. Every investment portfolio needs precious metal shares. Goldseek.com's top stock analysts have done it again, identifying the next solid gold nugget opportunity, Brazil Resources. Based in the eighth largest economy with a mining-friendly reputation, almost 10 million ounces of gold reserves. Industry insiders are accumulating shares of Brazil resources. The notable management team includes Chairman Amir Adnani, a rising star in the mining industry with a reputation for moving projects rapidly into production. Fortune magazine lists Chairman Adnani in the prestigious list of 40 under 40 ones to watch. Plus, shareholders benefit from the insights and backing of enigmatic Brazilian billionaire Mario Garnero, CEO of Brazil Invest Group, the nation's foremost merchant and investment bank and founding director. Their Sao George project is 100% owned with paved highway access, a nearby workforce, and a hydroelectric power source near the major gold deposits. Their next top project includes three deposits identified by major gold producers, plus their RIA project, which is a joint venture with Arriva, benefits from a $10 million treasure map in the hottest address for uranium production in Canada. But the story gets even more exciting with their Whistler project, offering geographic diversification in south-central Alaska. To find out more about this unique opportunity, please direct your web browsers to brazilresources.com at Yahoo Finance, ticker symbol B-R-I dot V. Remember to ride the exciting gold stock run of 2016 and beyond. Your portfolio will thank you for adding shares of Brazil Resources. Gold Seek employees may or may not own shares. Nothing contained herein should be construed as investment advice. Jim Rogers, financial author, commentator, hedge fund manager, co-founder of Quantum Fund, and author of several bestsellers back with us today from his office way around the world in Singapore. Welcome back, Jim Rogers. I am delighted to be here. You know, last year, red hot start, it fizzled out by the end of 2016. Now we're off to a a better start again, and the XAU held up much better than bullion. Uh, Do you like the shares? Corrections and rallies are very common in all markets. It doesn't matter what the market and what we're seeing is the process of gold trying to find its bottom. And in my view, it's not here yet. 
That's fair enough. Tell me your thoughts then on the uh, oil market. I understand you've gotten a bit bullish on crude. Like us, you're looking for maybe 60, 70 a barrel at least on black gold. Eventually, yes, uh, if not higher. My view is more that oil is making its bottom too. It's a complicated bottom. I don't think we've seen the low for this year yet, and I'm not even sure what the low will be. But, you know, a, a range of 30 to 60 or 40 to, to 60, something like that. I don't know, but it is making its bottom. And in 2000, you know, in two or three years, we'll look back and say in 2015, 2016, 2017, oil made energy and oil made, made the bottom. And now we're off to the races. Before it's over, it's going to be much, much higher because the world's known reserves of oil continue to decline, except for fracking. But fracking is, is a little bit suspect now since people realize it's not just a a simple gold mine. Exactly. A lot of grassroots backlash. People disappointed with all of a sudden, uh, you know, that rotten egg smell and what was formerly a very clean aquifer. It's, it's provided a lot of jobs for the Midwest, but as you say, is uh, seems to be fading. The CRB index, clearly black gold seemed to move almost in lockstep, at least in recent years. Looks like the CRB's put in a bottom. Is that another positive sign for the sector? Yes. The commodities are making, especially agriculture. We've discussed oil, base metals are certainly in the process of making a bottom. Had a big drop, having a rally, have had a rally. They too are making a bottom. And yes, I'm sure we're all going to look back in a few years and say, "Gosh, what a great opportunity that was." You've also kept a very close eye on U.S. stocks. It really surprised almost everyone that we talked to here, almost every pundit on the show. The presidential rally, I guess they're calling it. Do you think this was just an anomaly? Was this just maybe a relief rally? Will the Fed undo it with higher rates this year? Well, higher rates are definitely coming from the market and from the Fed. Whether that undoes the market or not, we'll we'll see. I suspect it will. You know, traditionally, when the Fed raises rates three times, you should be very, very worried. And on the fourth, you should not be worried. You should just run for the hills. So if history is any guy... Yes, when the Fed raises rates some more, you'll see more problems in the in the equity markets. Well, what would be the go-to asset? I mean, clearly our treasuries have been abysmal here uh, with very few signs of life, even on the recent bounce. If equities lose favor, will people maybe turn to um, commodities or will they look offshore for uh, you know emerging markets? One thing one could look to would be U.S. dollars cash. It's hated right now because it earns nothing. I'm very, very bullish on the U.S. dollar for a variety of reasons. One can look offshore. I'm optimistic about the Russian market, although people are starting to discover it now. We've discussed that before. Uh, There are other markets offshore where one can conceivably find opportunities. U.S. dollars is probably one of the best opportunities around right now because uh, there's going to be a lot of turmoil and in times of turmoil, people look for a safe haven. The world thinks the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It's not. The U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and things are getting worse. But people don't know what else to do, so they'll put in U.S. dollars, which is one reason I own a lot of U.S. dollars. Yes, you were one of the few on our show to catch that. Harry S. Dent Jr. as well as Bob Hoy were along with you because the U.S. dollar put a convincing technical bottom in place uh, last week. This might be a time for our folks with near-term uh, trading perspectives to pick up the greenback or UUP, the ticker ETF. With China celebrating its new year, the rooster, year of the rooster this year, do you see any opportunities there? Well, there was certainly China was certainly slow, partly because its customers are slowing. Some parts of the Chinese economy also have a lot of debt, which is going to cause problems in China. China hasn't had much debt for several decades for historical reasons, but now you're going to see bankruptcies, which are going to shock a lot of people. Having said all that, I'm not buying China at the moment. I own plenty of China. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just watching because I have not figured out what uh, Donald Trump is going to do. He keeps saying he's going to, the Chinese, he's going to hit them very, very hard. Trade wars have always been disastrous for everybody. Trade wars have, nobody's ever won a trade war, and trade wars have always led to bankruptcies. So what? Mr. Trump doesn't seem to care about all of that, or, or he thinks he's smarter than history. So I'm watching uh, to see what Trump does before I do anything else in China. And there is some talk about, um, I believe, levying high import taxes and, and whatnot to try to boost our exports. But you seem to think that might backfire? Always has. It's never worked. One of the lessons of history 
perhaps the main lesson of history is that very few people learn the lessons of history. And even the ones who know the lessons of history think they're smarter in history. It'll be different this time. Trump thinks he's, if he understands history, he thinks he's smarter than history. No, exactly. George Santiana said it well. You know, we've got to learn it or we repeat those lessons. And here's a lesson then. Debt, 20 trillion with a T. Two presidential terms, net from 10 trillion to 20 trillion. There's some talk that we may see 30 trillion before the first term. How does that impact your outlook on a longer term basis for commodities and the precious metals? I mean, typically, don't we see spectacular growth when that type of debt is uh, tacked on and the Fed's debt, too? Well, if we do have that kind of debt or growth, then yes, you're certainly going to see a lot more demand. And demand obviously leads to higher prices of real assets and real goods. It also leads to higher interest rates as well. Now, you can have bull markets with higher interest rates, at least for a while. That, too, history shows. So we, we can have it, sure. When the debt was $10 trillion, many people said, gosh, $10 trillion, that's, that's a nightmare. Now it's 20 and the market's making all-time highs. So why not 30? Why not 40? The point, of course, though, is that somewhere along the line, somebody's going to have to print a lot more money in order to get there. We went from 10 to 20 with a lot of money printing. So with more money printing, sure. Do you expect then uh, to see a situation like we've seen in India, you know, with Prime Minister Modi uh, gutting the economy, bringing everything to a screeching halt simply by declaring we're going to go to a digital currency? Is that keeping you up at night or do you see opportunity there? It's certainly troubling. I'm not sure what, what one can do about it if the whole world eliminates cash and, and everything is digital. That's what governments would love, because if there's di- only digital money, they can control our lives much, much easier and much better. That's not good for the world. That's not good for you and me. It may be good for a few politicians, but it's certainly troubling. Is it keeping it up at night? No. I have not yet figured out a way to uh, circumvent it if and when it happens. Perhaps gold coins, but... Even then, demand for gold coins will probably decline because what can you do with them? You can't really sell them. I guess you can sell them, but even then, everybody knows what you're doing. By the way, if you can figure out the refuge, please let me know. I'm I'm trying to grapple with it like everybody else. Exactly. Well, maybe a, a silver or gold-backed cryptocurrency. My guess is, though, you'd still agree that it's an excellent safe haven. Even if it's not ideal or perfect, uh, it eclipses much of the you know alternatives we have today. What do you have? You have the bank? You, you're right. There are not many alternatives. Farms are a good alternative, but they're not very liquid. Food products are great alternative if you, if you know how to buy and sell them. But you're right, there are not many alternatives. Any new book that you're working on or any plans for the next bestseller? No, no, I don't, I'm not doing any, any more any books. It's certainly not at the moment anyway. There's a lady in China who's writing a book about me, but it'll be in Chinese, so it won't be much use to, to, to many people on your show. Uh, if I do something, I'll let you know. Very good. Can you give us a hint on, on any topic that, that's caught your attention? My guess it would be the opportunity in uh, either Asia or Russia. I mean, Russian government bonds right now have very, very high yields. I'm optimistic about the future of Russia. Mr. Trump seems to like Russia a lot uh, or, or dislike them less than many other people. So he's sure that buy Russian government bonds. Jim Rogers, we appreciate your thoughts. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. This is Robert Ian with GoldSeek.com Radio. The healthcare battle rages forward. The challenge all of us face with government involvement in health care is not just the administration and delivery of our health services, which for many represent the essence of their personal survival. No, from a government perspective, health care is about managing and controlling one fifth of the U.S. economy. That number has increased from one-seventh of the U.S. economy, when in 1993, First Lady Hillary Clinton sought to implement a single-payer health care plan referred to as Clinton Care. At that time, the goal was transparent, a single-payer system to help fill the gaps for those 30-plus million people who did not have health care at the time. That initiative was soundly defeated in 1994, with the Republican takeover of the House and Senate 
for the first time in a generation. The goal of a single-payer system didn't go away. Its proponents quietly worked for over a decade and a half, and then ushered in Obamacare in 2010. The health care exchanges were designed to create the illusion of competition and capitalism in an otherwise socialistic endeavor. Today, many states and portions of states are down to just one Obamacare provider in that state. The other insurance providers have systematically exited the system because of exploding costs. Now we have a repeal and replace initiative, center stage for all to consider. Replacing it with what is the multi-billion dollar question. What is so disingenuous about the health care debate is that with few exceptions, those supposed thought leaders and talking heads on television, radio, and in print, are not experiencing the systemic challenges many of those under Obamacare are experiencing. They are not signing up for Obamacare and sending in their financial information to the health care exchange, only to have it kicked back and have to resubmit it again. Do you really think the president or members of Congress experience the same challenges as everyone else? Ask your elected officials, when they are back in your district, to outline step-by-step step their process for obtaining health care, what their deductibles are, who they actually see or have access to, even in Washington, for their care. And then remember that they are deciding for the rest of the country. But it's really about more than that. It's about the allocation and reallocation of one-fifth of the U.S. economy. Health care is simply the means to that end. If mowing lawns made up one-fifth of the U.S. economy, that segment of the economy would have been nationalized as well. Not because we want everyone to have nice lawns, or that some may not have lawn mowers and cannot mow their lawns. The real reason is it would represent one-fifth of our economic activity, and that is just too tempting a target not to interfere with. Ask Paul Ryan how in touch he really is with health care, as a consumer of it, or any of the talking heads on TV who are so detached from what they call the flyover zone, which is middle America. There is a strategy used in many situations to usher in what is initially considered to be politically unpopular initiatives, in this case, national health care. It's called Problem, Reaction, Solution. You start by creating legislation that will ultimately result in a particular problem when implemented. That problem will produce a predictable reaction from the public, who will demand a real solution. And in all likelihood, that solution will be some variation of the original initiative that was too unpopular in the first place. In the case of health care, failing exchanges and deserting insurers are the problem which have resulted in a reaction defined as repeal and replace. And now the solution will be ushered in. Maybe this initial solution will not be a single-payer system like Medicare, but it may very well morph into some such system. Why? Because 
Obama won in 2010, when health care was nationalized. The genie will never go completely back into the bottle. The bottle will shatter first. That genie came out of the bottle when Congress passed a health care plan that no one read, until after the fact. I'm guessing if directly polled, few, if any, in Congress have ever read the 2,500-plus pages of Obamacare and all the addendums that have been added since. Outside of any operational efficiencies to be had, there are three choices with health care. Tax people more and raise their premiums. Cut their services. Or increase deficit spending. What I call printing the difference. Guess what? When the smoke clears, they will print the difference. The resulting system may be relabeled, but make no mistake, the cost difference will be printed, and living standards will erode even more as we pay lip service to reform. And until next time, this is Robert Ian with ConquerChange.com, reminding you to follow us on Twitter at ConquerChange. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Robert, thanks for another excellent installment. Well, that wraps up this week's GoldSeek.com radio episode. For two new big guests, be sure to check out next week's show. Until we talk to you again, have a great week. The gold and silver mining sector is red hot. Every investment portfolio needs precious metal shares. GoldSeek.com's top stock analysts have done it again, identifying the next solid gold nugget opportunity, Brazil Resources. Based in the eighth largest economy with a mining-friendly reputation, almost 10 million ounces of gold reserves. Industry insiders are accumulating shares of Brazil Resources. The notable management team includes Chairman Amir Adnani, a rising star in the mining industry with a reputation for moving projects rapidly into production. Fortune Magazine lists Chairman Adnani in the prestigious list of 40 under 40 ones to watch. Plus, shareholders benefit from the insights and backing of enigmatic Brazilian billionaire Mario Garnero, CEO of Brazil Invest Group, the nation's foremost merchant and investment bank and founding director. Their Sao George project is 100% owned with paved highway access, a nearby workforce, and a hydroelectric power source near the major gold deposits. Their next top project includes three deposits identified by major gold producers, plus their RIA project, which is a joint venture with Arriva, benefits from a $10 million treasure map in the hottest address for uranium production in Canada. But the story gets even more more exciting with their Whistler project, offering geographic 